My name is Kelly Dieck, and I am very pleased again to be able to speak to you this afternoon. To give you a little bit of my background, I have spent my entire career in the laboratory. It started 28 years ago as a cytotechnologist fresh out of school. After a few years, my interest grew in the field of histology, and one of the histotechs in our anatomic pathology department took me under her wing and taught me the skills I needed to be successful. Eventually, I was able to sit for the histologist certification examination. After a few years, I took interest in the quality, regulatory, and compliance worlds for the general laboratory. At the same time, I began assume, assuming a more technical advisory role for the AP departments as my hospital merged with others and we became a system laboratory. In doing so, I became intrigued with ways to use a lot of the guiding principles geared towards the clinical lab as tools in the anatomic pathology department. With that in mind, the agenda for this presentation this afternoon will include the following items in relation to quality monitoring in the histology laboratory. We're gonna first talk about the concept of quality management system essentials as defined by CLSI. We will discuss non-conformance management, including ways to track and trend. We'll talk about some internal assessments in the histology department with some specific examples on the process and ideas for histology data collection. Our discussion will then take a turn toward, towards external assessments and their use along with the concept of continual improvement. And then finally, we will touch upon the process of reviewing the quality program annually and how to go about doing this. So we're gonna begin today's presentation with an excerpt from the NWI Times written by Mike Hoban that sort of sheds some light on why we as laboratorians need a sound quality monitoring system in our departments. The article he wrote centers around the 99% mark and whether or not that should be considered acceptable compliance in the real world. I wanna talk about quality in its general sense. I feel like we drive people crazy with quality because we know we have good staff. And so people think, well, of course we're a good quality lab. Why do we need to do all these things to prove that? So several dictionaries define quality as, and I quote, the degree to which a product or service meets requirements. Laboratories need to provide quality to their customers in many forms. Most importantly, safe, comfortable experiences provided to all patients, properly collected and labeled specimens provided for testing, timely, accurate test results and reports provided to physicians and other healthcare personnel, and then informative and helpful consultations and answers to questions. To best meet regulatory and accreditation requirements, the laboratory needs to bring a quality philosophy into all of its activities, and good lab strives to do this, but at times might fall short for one reason or another. So how good is good? When you fall short, and there are many reasons that can contribute to this shortfall, should you be concerned? It is often stated that 99.9% .9 is pretty doggone good, allowing the 0.1% for natural human error. But in reality, how good is 99.9%? .9 so here are some examples I wanted to share of what that 99.9% .9 perfection leads to. So we would have no electricity for 10 minutes each week. 2.8 million phone calls in the US would reach the wrong number every day. 810 commercial airline flights would crash every month. Our heart would miss 32,000 beats each year. 107 incorrect medical procedures would be performed every day. 43 minutes of unsafe drinking water would come out of our faucets each month and 76 newborn babies each month in the United States would be given to the wrong parents. So some of these items seem pretty bad to me. So imagine if the error rate in these examples was anything greater than 0.1%. Think about what sort of compliance rates you see in your department. How do they compare to the 99.9% .9 that is showcased in this article? So it is for this reason that laboratories are required to implement quality management systems and processes. Because with quality programs in place, we often don't see 99.9% .9 compliance. But imagine what things would be like without a quality program. The term quality management system is a very high level term we use for everything we do as part of our quality plan. 
generally speaking, all of the management activities that leadership teams perform support in some way the laboratory's ability to meet regulatory and accreditation requirements and fulfill the need for accurate results in a timely manner. These are best represented by the quality system essentials or commonly referred to as the QSE concept. QSEs are published as part of the CLSI guideline for quality improvement. If you don't have this guideline, I would highly recommend it. QSEs are the foundational building blocks that support the laboratory's pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic workflow for all types, sizes, specialties, and scopes of laboratories. Each of the QSEs can be categorized into one of three buckets. This first group makes up the lab bucket, organization, customer focus, facilities and safety, personnel, purchasing and inventory, and equipment. These are the items necessary for the basic foundation of running a lab. This next group shows what is included in the work bucket, process management, documents and records, and information management. These items are important for the operational tasks carried out within the lab. The last group of items makes up the measurement bucket. These are the items that are essential in the measuring of the department's success and are what make up uh, what quality monitoring that is often discussed. We are only going to discuss these last three elements that deal with measurement today, specifically non-conformance management, internal and external assessments, and continual improvement. These are the critical components that should make up the quality monitoring program within the histology department. The first element of measurement we are going to discuss is non-conformance management. Non-conformance management can also be called occurrence, incident, or variation management. This concept includes several components. The first one is the capture of the information of the occurrence, generally on an occurrence report form of some kind. I'm going to share an example of a form that can be used in future slides. Then once that basic information is collected and documented, there are three other key elements of non-conformance management. Immediate action and investigation is the first one. This is the act of understanding the issue that occurred and determining what the immediate solution is if there, is, if there needs to be one. Occurrence analysis is next, which is the thorough understanding of why something happened as it did, basically why the incident occurred and what contributed to the incident. The last element is the corrective action to be taken. This is the more long-term plan to prevent the incident from happening again. Corrective action is the most important part of nonconformance management and where the emphasis is placed by regulatory agencies. Reporting of problems is only a beneficial process if action is taken to prevent it from happening again. Additionally, it is the corrective action that often encourages staff to report problems if staff believe that no action is going to be taken on incidents that are reported, then they are often less inclined to report. There are several types of nonconformances. We're gonna review each one here. Accidents is the first one listed here on the slide. These are usually just inadvertent actions. The next one is adverse reactions. These generally involve patients with an adverse outcome to something that was performed. For example, a transfusion-related reaction or a phlebotomy-related negative outcome, like a hematoma. In histology, we generally don't have a lot of adverse reactions. Complaints is next and can involve patients as well as providers and are a result of the lab not meeting a patient's or provider's expectations. Patients' providers are not satisfied for one reason or the other. In histology, we generally see provider issues. For example, the turnaround time wasn't acceptable or perhaps a provider was not happy with the way a sample was handled in terms of testing or perhaps maybe a provider did not receive a copy of his or her report. The fourth item is discrepancies. This is related to the outcome obtained, either not being expected or not relating to previous history. For instance, an IHC or a special stain outcome does not match the morphology of the H&E, or maybe the staining of the control slide for a special stain does not match what is expected. And the final category is errors. 
This is generally a human or a system problem. These are the mistakes that are made by the staff member during the course of a process. These could also be issues that arise due to equipment not functioning as expected. These are all kinds of things that should be reported as part of your non-conformance management program. Information about events within the department that deviate from accepted policy, process, or procedure needs to be captured and acted upon. An internal non-conformance management system captures and analyzes information about non-conformances that occurred across the entire departmental workflow. All staff need to understand that non-conformances present information about department processes that do not work as they should, and thus knowledge of these problems provide opportunities for improvement. Staff should be encouraged to report these with the emphasis that this reporting is non-punitive. Our department actually separates reports on non-conformances. We look at lab versus non-lab versus outreach. And this helps us to identify how our corrective action and our education needs to be targeted. So a standard report form can be used to capture information on all occurrences. On the next few slides, I will show you an example of a report form that can be used to report occurrences. I had to break it up over a few slides. So what you are seeing now on the slide is the first section. This report can be completed by either the staff member or a member of leadership to capture the information. Once completed, this report is submitted to a member of leadership for review and investigation. So I wanna highlight a few of the fields for you before we move on. First of all, you will notice here the title is Deviation from Standard Protocol Form. The intent here was to eliminate the perception that this process is punitive. Um, we tried to get away from calling it an error tracking form or words of that nature so that employees you know, would kind of shy away from it a little bit in terms of filling it out. Section A includes the basic identification information. So facility, date, shift in which the incident occurred, um, the employee involved and their lab information system code, the involved patient name and the corresponding test code and a session number if that happened to be applicable. Section B, section B allows us to classify the incident and give a brief explanation of what occurred. In this example, um, I've got it written down as a technical variance and the explanation was that the specimen, being a gallbladder, uh, was not embedded on edge. Um, this section also allows us to document if a revised report had to be issued because of this incident. Again, gives us a way to um, monitor our uh, corrected uh, re results. And then moving on to section C, uh, this is only completed then if we do have a corrected report involved. This section allows the user to document the result correction information. So section D is where the user will document the level of effect on the patient care so that the significance of the deviation can be understood. The name of the person completing the report is documented as well as any suggestions for improvement offered by the employee. This section is used to document the action plan and follow-up. Signatures are also included in this section as you can see there. And the employee is asked to sign the document indicating their review. Uh, and I wanna point out this is not necessarily their agreement that the incident is being documented or that the, they feel, you know, if they feel like this is more of an at fault sort of document, it's just more of a, you know, we, we like to give the employees the opportunity to review it, to indicate their review, definitely give us feedback. And then we do ask for that signature. However, um, in the event they decide they don't want to sign it, um, you know, we still kind of keep that in, in our normal documentation process. Um, the histology general supervisor also signs and documents their corrective action or action plan for the incident. And then the entire document is reviewed and signed by the laboratory director, technical supervisor, and the medical director. So section E here is everything I've shown you so far is kind of on one side of the paper. And then section E is, is what we put on either a, a, the back or a, a second page. And it's really more for specimen submission issues. So we kind of separate it. So if it's only a specimen submission issue, 
then the staff will only fill out um, this particular part of the of the uh, form. Uh, and the first and the so the items in the first four sections don't really apply when we want to document the specimen submission issue, which is why we kind of called this out separately. Um, so in these cases, we only fill out this section, and this and then this is all that is submitted. So the nonconformance reporting process needs to be clearly defined so that information is tracked and acted upon as feedback is provided. There are several steps that are taking, taken after events are reported. Of course, the very first step after an issue is identified is to take care of it immediately. This is called the remedial action. It consists of the very basic steps to remedy the problem. The remedial action that was taken when the issue was identified most often does not address the real cause of the problem, which can be determined only through investigation. Therefore, investigation of complaints or errors provides an opportunity to identify those factors that contributed to the problem. So once we have done this, our next sequence of actions centers around trying to come up with a plan in order to implement corrective action. In our department, the first step is determining who is involved and where the incident originated, meaning the department, someone outside the laboratory, for example, surgery, or somewhere outside of the healthcare system itself, like a physician office. This sort of drives how we report and record the incident. Simply put, we have different trending systems depending on where our corrective action will fall. We have one database that houses our kind of internal to laboratory issues, one that houses our hospital issues, and then a separate system that helps collate our outreach or physician office issues. This segregation helps us keep track of our resolution process. Once we have determined which bucket the issue falls into, we focus on two things sort of simultaneously. One being what steps need to be taken to prevent this from happening again. This is the investigation part of the process and includes figuring out the what and why to the issue. And the second being the determination of any trends, answering the question, has this occurred in the past? And if so, were the circumstances the same? Process improvement tools are used to identify the contributing factors and to determine the best way to remove them through implementing corrective action. So this is an example of the report that we generate on a monthly basis from the database where we record internal to laboratory issues. We trend internal issues by employee, by shift, department, job code, facility, um, by the actual incident, as you can see here, um, the incident type that occurred. And then we also look at the phase of testing, pre-analytic, analytic, post-analytic. Post -analytic. Occurrences are entered into the database on a regular basis. So, so we get all those sheets that I showed you earlier, and those are submitted, and then someone takes all of those and enters those into a database. And reports are generated on a monthly basis, looking at usually a three-month rolling period. Corrective action is documented manually on those tracking submission forms and retained in the employee file as necessary. This particular report is reviewed monthly by the Laboratory Quality Committee. As larger issues or trends are identified, projects then are created and assigned from this report. Examples of issues found on this report would be things like embedding a sample incorrectly or cutting too deep into the block, um, compromising specimen integrity, not cutting deep enough into the block and missing the full sections of the margin, um, or mislabeling related to the hist histology scope of the process. It's important to note here that while reporting of nonconformances are taught to be non-punitive, there is a place for disciplinary action when there is a trend that a staff member has made the same error multiple times and the error has been found to be contributed to carelessness. The non-punitive approach does not mean that staff can be negligent and there are not to be consequences. So this report, or this example here, is a report that is generated from the database where we record those things that are external to laboratory, but within the hospital. So we trend external issues by facility, by department, and by the actual incident type. Occurrences, these kind of occurrences are entered then into a database on a regular basis again, and reports are generated on a monthly basis, usually looking at, again, that three to four month rolling uh, period. You see four months here. 
Corrective action is then actually documented electronically in the system by the hospital department involved. So it's kind of an electronic um, submission of the incident, which then gets routed to the hospital department. The hospital department then will document what their corrective action is within that same system. Corrective action is usually determined by the leadership of the hospital department. However, the histology department does review that corrective action in order to ensure that 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 action is acceptable, meaning we don't always want to say, you know, continue to monitor. We actually want to look for a little bit of meat in our corrective action, um, whether that be education or providing different resources um, for people to read or demonstrations. So examples of issues that would be found on this report would be things like labeling issues and issues associated with fixation of specimens and transport issues that would typically come from your, you know, your surgical departments, um, ED sometimes, sometimes the floors, sometimes your same day surgery departments. Um, those areas are probably most common for the histology department. So the next topic we're gonna discuss is internal assessments. Unlike externally delivered compliance inspections, internal audits assess a specific laboratory process and determine by review of documents and records, conducting interviews and observing staff in action, whether the laboratory is following its own processes and procedures as well as meeting applicable requirements. These are activities that are ongoing and do not revolve around an inspection cycle or event. Internal assessments can include Established monitors, which can also be called indicators. These are usually tools that assess daily, monthly activity used over a 12 month period of time and trended month to month and then year to year. Or auditing activities, which usually include things that might be monitored less regularly, maybe quarterly or one time, and usually include some, some sort of audit report. These audits could, could then be prospective or they could also be uh, retrospective. So now we're gonna take a deep dive into internal assessments as they relate to histology. It is important to implement relevant monitors for the department if the goal is really to improve performance. It is ineffective to choose monitors where the compliance is at 100% all the time. There is certainly a place for these. We all need to report on processes that are going well, but this cannot be the case for all monitors. The best way to choose what you are going to monitor in the department is to look for things that are high risk, high volume, and problem prone. Of course, we all have those items that we must monitor. For example, frozen section turnaround time if you are CAP accredited. But when choosing those monitors that you are going to use to round out your monitoring plans, choose things that you know you need to work on. This is where you get your biggest bang for your buck, if you will, because not only will you get a handle on where you stand with the process in terms of how good are you, but you also have then identified something you can improve to make your department better. It is best to collect data on a monthly basis, and it is important to get input from your staff on what sort of data you should be collecting. Believe me, your staff know what your problems are in the department. So getting their input on quality monitors can often be very important and quite revealing. Communication each month to your staff as to how the department performed is very important. It is amazing sometimes how much more effort the staff will make when they are aware of statistics and thresholds. We all want to shine and we all want to make sure all staff and departments are accountable. So the more you communicate and get your staff involved, the better outcomes you will see. Staff meetings are a great way to communicate the monthly, monthly standings. It is also very effective to post the findings so as to promote transparency, good or bad. And then lastly, as we did for non-conformances, it is important to regularly document the corrective action if you did not meet the threshold for the time period. As you move through each month, you evaluate your corrective action to see if it did any good. If not, then you change it up and you try something else. So here are some examples of monitors that can be used for the histology department. Of course, there are many, many options of what can be monitored within the department. And while some of the monitors might be the same, most monitors are going to be unique to the individual organization because we all have a different set of issues, needs, and uh, in, and environments. So to give you some ideas of quality monitors that can be assessed, I will review a few I have seen over the years. 
The first one is autopsy effectiveness. This particular monitor included the tracking of time taken for the preliminary and final reports for autopsies. Additionally, the completion of a required educational tool was tracked in order to ensure there was documentation of the educational significance of the autopsy procedure. Frozen section turnaround time, as I mentioned earlier, is a monitor that most facilities track, and this monitor tracks the time spent from the start of the frozen section to the time a diagnosis is rendered from the event. Frozen section um, IOC and final diagnosis comparison compares the diagnosis at the time of the frozen to the diagnosis rendered from the permanent section. Again, this is actually quite a common one. Consultation correlations can be performed by comparing the diagnosis rendered by the original pathologist as compared to the consulting pathologist when a cons consultation is ordered. Revised report rates is an interesting monitor, not always very popular, but revealing nonetheless. This quality monitor tracks can track how many times a revised report is created and the reason behind the creation. This is actually something we do it at my institution and we report these rates and why they were reported actually by pathologist um, to the pathologist so that they're aware of, of the reasons revised reports are, are coming out and to what extent. Daily quality evaluation. This is feedback received daily on the routine preparations and the number of, of negative comments received and what those comments relate to. So for example, um, we look at it by case um, and we, and we in particular, look at things like, you know, are there comments on poor micronomy or is there inappropriate embedding? Um, you know, do we have incomplete decalcification? Is there poor staining? Um, and we try to group those and summarize those so we can really see what areas we need to take a look at in terms of education, perhaps, for our histotechs. General AP process review um, I've seen include kind of a random sample of cases. Reviewed really from start to finish from the time of patient registration to the time of the report was signed out to ensure that every step of the process was correct. Um, this one could be somewhat labor intensive, so sometimes the, the sample size I've seen be on the smaller size, like 20 or you know 25, um, but it is sort of revealing to again see where your issues are in terms of, of that process. And then the last one we'll talk about is just Q&S, um, quantity not sufficient. Um, and it, it, this one, particular one looked at the number of samples, a uh, number of time samples were sent out and QNS was determined. So obviously kind of a waste of time if we're sending out samples that are QNS. Again, there are many things to monitor on the histology department. This is just a very small list of examples. So after we determine what our quality monitors are going to be for the department, a guideline is prepared in order to document every aspect of the quality monitor, data collection and reporting process. This helps facilitate the process so anyone can do it at any time. They will know exactly how the data is collected, what reports to pull, how to pull them, how to count for the numerator and denominator, and how and when to report. This remo removes all ambiguity for the data collection so that you can ensure you are consistent in what you are reporting. It is good practice to create these guidelines and then obtain medical director sign off to show their approval for your quality improvement program. It kind of kills two birds with one stone. So this is an example of a quality guideline and the key elements included. Again, this document spans over a few slides, so we'll review each section on the form. I was trying to make it so you could see it and the print wasn't super tiny. This first slide shows the basic information of the indicator, what department it applies to, what the purpose is of the indicator, basically what you are monitoring, and whether the monitor focuses on pre-analytic, analytic, or, post, or a post-analytic process. This is where it is also documented where the outcome of the monitor is reported, so internal or external to lab, and then the core strategy of the indicator. So part one of the form continues here, and it allows you to indicate what you are measuring in a general sense, and then allows you to list any references you might have used to create that monitor. And then part two is, that is, is kind of the next section. So that top section was still the rest of part one. So part two is the actual um, description of the indicator, and then the data collection process. Uh, in the first part there, we describe the data being measured, and if there are any exceptions, so things that we might not 
one account into it for one reason or another. The data gathering procedure is outlined in detail along with who is responsible for doing it and what the frequency of data collection is for the monitor. So this is where we go into great detail here because I have found over the years that as people leave or retire or you know you pass the responsibility from one person to the next, everybody ends up kind of doing it a different way. So this was one way we could actually get down on a piece of paper exactly how the data was gonna be pulled so that knowledge transfer was very easy. The last section of part two describes what forms are used and whether or not the data collection is a sampling or is everything being counted and then is there a baseline? And then finally, what the target or goal is for the monitor. Then on to part three of the form. Part three describes the indicator analysis and interpretation, basically what is done with the data um, that is collected. The analysis plan tells you how the data will be reported and then finishes up by summarizing who will be reporting it and to whom and when. On an ongoing basis, data is collected and submitted to lab leadership using what we call a summary form. This form outlines the basic information of the quality monitor, for example, the outcome of, for the month, the threshold if applicable, and then it is also required to be signed by our administrative leadership team as well as our medical director, again, to show their involvement in the process. So this is an example of that summary form and the key elements included. So we have the title is listed at the top with our month, year, and facility to which it applies. And then the next section is where the data that was collected is actually reported with the section following being where the corrective action is documented. The last section then includes that spot where the person completing the data gathering is documented so we know who to talk to if there are questions. And then final sign off is then obtained from laboratory leadership and the medical director. So then at the end of these, at the end of each month, all of those summary forms are collated and the data is reviewed by the leadership team and the medical director. Corrective action is documented on these forms for the month's compliance outcome. This is an example then of the month end reporting spreadsheet that we use. This represents just one section for one monitor. Each monitor has their own section and each monitor, um, each, and each monitor so they can be easily matched up and located on the spreadsheet. You can see the number on the left hand side. So the 62. So that number is on the bottom of the summary sheet and then we put it on this spreadsheet so then we can just match them up quickly or find it quickly as we're entering the data each month. So then what happens is each month all of the quality monitors for the department are entered into the spreadsheet and then used to discuss at the lab management meetings and lab quality <clears throat> committee meetings. You can see each monitor has an area for raw data to be entered with the compliance automatically tabulated then by a formula, formula each month and then it rolls up quarterly, and then it rolls, rolls up year to date. Also built into the spreadsheet are graphical tools that can be printed should a picture tell the story better than the actual raw data. And you'll find many times this is actually what um, our leadership team will post um, so that staff are familiar and, and know what the, where they were for the particular month. So in addition to monitors that are tracked on a scheduled ongoing basis, you should also use the auditing process in your departments. Auditing can be performed to provide data for areas of needed improvement or to show areas of compliance. Audits are usually one time, um, meaning that they are just performed once and then you're done or they can be scheduled, meaning maybe they're done quarterly, like maybe you're doing quarterly safety audits where you have staff walk around with a recording form and assess the compliance with the lab safety standards. Audits can be prospective, so the audit is sort of real time, if you will, or the audit can be retrospective, so you're looking at information in the past. A lot of times you see billing audits are retrospective. So moving on, uh, external assessments is the second arena we are going to explore today. These are likely the assessments people dread the most. Being assessed by someone else is often a tenuous and tedious process, albeit necessary in order to eliminate as much bias as possible. It is good to have someone outside of your lab evaluate the job you think you are doing well, if not for anything else but to substantiate that. So these are a few types of external assessments, proficiency testing, accreditation assessment, and benchmarking. 
For proficiency testing programs, the laboratory receives samples for testing from a designated PT provider and performs the testing using its routine processes, procedures, and staff. Results are compared to those of the PT provider and then other laboratories, and the laboratory gets a report of its performance. Accreditation assessment, or inspections as we know them, is the process that we all know and love where we are expected to abide by a set of standards and are evaluated by an outside organization as to whether we meet those elements of compliance. Benchmarking then is that process of comparing your lab to another by way of comparing data from your lab to published data of another. So there are two ways to skin a cat and proficiency testing is a great way to compare your everyday operations in terms of testing to that of your peers. The basic principles of proficiency testing require the department to handle proficiency testing specimens as you would any patient testing sample. This allows you to get a true picture of whether your process works and you get the same answer, if you will, as your peers, even though their process might not be exactly the same. For the histology department, there are many opportunities for proficiency testing and labs should take advantage of these whether they are required or not. There are some that we must partake in, HER2, ER, PR, et cetera, those surveys that align with our prognostic IHC if we are performing that in the lab. And then there are those that assess the interpretive components of surgical cases. But there are also surveys that assess the technical components in the lab that should be taken advantage of if your lab can afford to do so. These can also be used as part of, as part of the competency assessment process. The most important part of this process is what you do with the results once you, once you get them returned. If everything is in check, you are good to go. But if there are submissions that don't quite align with that of your peers, it is important to figure out why and see if there are ways to improve or change your process in order to better align with the majority results. Of course, there are times when there is a good reason that you don't align with the majority, but make sure that you are able to justify why that, why that is the case. Inspections are the second means of external assessments that we are going to talk about. While often dreaded, they are an excellent way to get someone else's perspective and ideas about how things can be done, and in many cases, improved. As most are familiar, inspections, regardless of who you are inspected by, are accompanied by a list of standards and expectations that you must meet in order to gain the accreditation you are seeking. The most used outside accrediting organization is the College of American Pathologists, or CAP, there are others that can be used as well, however. Joint Commission accredits many laboratories across the United States. Either way, these organizations have expectations that must be met in order to achieve their accreditation. It is important to have a process in place to prepare for these inspections. These inspections should not be a one-time snapshot of what your lab looks like, meaning the preceding months should not be spent scrambling to get your department in compliance with the standards. It should be an ongoing process of auditing your histology department to ensure that you are always in compliance and it doesn't really matter when your actual inspection date is. Inspectors could really come anytime because you are always ready. We call this ongoing inspection readiness. Um, we do not expect to see anything different in our department one day before inspection as compared to one year in terms of our documentation, etc. Of course, there might be things you get ready just prior, like pulling slides or reports, for examples, but those items should be limited. This helps staff feel much more comfortable with the inspection process and it eliminates that inspection chaos where the department is scrambling to get things ready. Requiring regular review of checklists and changes is a good practice to facilitate this approach. As you review checklists and the changes, put your processes in place at the time in order to meet the new standard. Use that opportunity to then audit your existing processes, perform mock inspections, require annual audits of the most current checklist. So the final topic we're going to discuss today is continual process improvement. Opportunities for improvement can be identified from all of the items we have discussed today. Um, so I just kind of listed them again here just to sort of summarize and, and kind of remind some of the things that we've talked about. Part of the process of continual process improvement is the ongoing and formal annual review of the program. It is no good to put a plan into place and then file it away and never look at it again and just continue to do the same thing year after year without ever reassessing its usefulness. This is a very ineffective way of running a quality improvement program. A dynamic program instead is a very effective way to ensure quality improvement in the histology department. 
This is how you ensure activities that have run their course are eliminated and stretch goals are set for the staff and department to continually find ways to make your histology department better. Quality monitoring activities that are trended are typically run over a 12 month period and trended from month to month and year to year. A 12 month period can either be a calendar year or a fiscal year, depending on what, your, what makes sense for your organization. Either way, your annual review should be done a month or so before the end of your 12 month cycle so that you can get all your edits done and approved prior to the beginning of the new cycle. So for example, if your cycle runs July through June, it is good practice to start your annual review around maybe April or May so that you are ready to begin your new plan on July 1. More ad hoc activities can be added and eliminated than as, as the need dictates. So as you complete your annual review, assess what monitors, if any, can be eliminated. Drop those monitors that are no longer needed or are maybe no longer applicable. Additionally, review all monitors for changes that might be needed. Edit those monitors that either need editing based on testing changes perhaps, or maybe you set a threshold that was way too high or maybe way too low. And then annual review is also a good time to implement new monitors. Starting new monitors at the beginning of the cycle is a great way to kind of fold them into your program. There might be new regulatory standards that need to be met with the new monitor, or perhaps you have added new testing to the histology department that needs a closer look. Maybe from your non-conformance management, you've been getting complaints on the turnaround time for your IHC, and you wanna gather data to get an understanding of whether you really have a problem or not. So generally speaking, the department should also use this time to decide if there are other random activities that, could, that should be implemented. You know, are there audits that need to be performed in any particular area? For example, do the histology staff all wear the appropriate PPE when they're performing tasks? Do we even know the answer? Sometimes audits are performed just to establish that answer. Yep, all staff are diligent in wearing their PPE when they're supposed to, or you might find out that, hey, we have a problem, and this is something we need to monitor more closely. I've seen a lot of times we will do kind of spot checks or kind of auditing exercises, and then those audits the results of those audits will eventually evolve into you know, a quality monitor or a process improvement or something of that nature. So with that, I would like to conclude by saying that over the years, I have seen histology and the anatomic pathology field as a whole become an increasingly heavy player within the laboratory industry. New and exciting concepts are being integrated into the histology department in ways that have never been dealt with before. I remember the days where our days only consisted of H&Es and a smattering of special stains. IHC was just beginning to take hold as an offering. With science moving as fast as it is, the histology depart department is going to continue to play an integral role, and I believe an expanded role with therapeutic staining gaining a lot of momentum. With that expectation, good ongoing quality programs are going to need to be in place to ensure success. I hope that you have found this presentation worthwhile and valuable. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me at my email address indicated in this last slide.